made it all the way to June in this quarantine. And June, of course, is Pride Month. And to celebrate, we're joined by two filmmakers who are at the forefront of the new queer cinema movement. Very thrilled to have them both with us. So I'll do uh, my intros quickly, <laughs> seeing as uh, time's getting on. First up, he's the writer-director of queer classics such as uh, Malanoche and My Own Private Idaho, the indie classic drugstore Cowboy. He's twice Oscar nominated for Best Director for Goodwill Hunting and Milk. Uh, he's a five-time Spirit Award nominee for Best Director and a two-time winner for Best Screenplay. Uh, he's one of the few filmmakers to win Best Director and the Palme d'Or for the same film at Cannes, that was Elephant. Uh, his other films include Last Days, Paranoid Park, and most recently, Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot. The great Gus Van Sant is with us. Welcome, Gus. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. You are here at the request of our other guest. Uh, he's the writer, director, actor behind the now classic genre bending and gender bending stage and screen musical Hedwig and the Angry Inch, for which he was nominated for three Spirit Awards. His other credits include Short Bus, Rabbit Hole, and How to Talk to Girls at Parties. Uh, his acting credits include Girls, Vinyl, and most recently Shrill, that's on Hulu. The great uh, John Cameron Mitchell's with us. Hi, John. Hi. I think we've done. used up all our time with our guests. Yes. <laughs> well, it was great to see you both. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> <laughs> How are you both doing? How, how's the quarantine you know, you know, holding up for you both? Good. Gus and I were in a quarantine pod for a while in, uh, in Palm, Palm Springs, Springs, which is uh, where the traditionally where the gays go to die, but we came, we went there to live. They go there to party now. Do they? Yeah, until they die. <laughs> <laughs> until they die. Um, but it was a great place to, to hide and it's gorgeous. And now I'm in Point Reyes in the Bay Area and oh, nice. heading to Provincetown, going to all the gay, gay spots. You, and Gus, are you in Oregon? I, I'm in uh, Palm Springs. Oh. Nice. So that's uh, how we met here. John was, you were seeking refuge, right? From, uh, you were just uh, left Running in California. New York. Yeah. yeah, and you couldn't get I back. On, I was on tour uh, with my Hedwig theme concert tour, uh, The Origin of Love, crowd surfing and, and spreading COVID unwittingly. No, I wasn't. Um, but then I uh, decided New York probably wasn't the best place to be. Right. Yeah, there were a lot of parties that caught people's attention during the quarantine. So, you hear about all those? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, the New York parties. Yes, the meth, the meth ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, how this works? Uh, the coffee talks are unmoderated conversations. So I'm going to sort of step off this virtual stage and let you both chat for about half an hour and catch up, talk shop. And then I'll be back with some questions from the audience. The audience can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we'll try and get through as many of those as possible. But uh, for now, it's over to the two of you. Great, thanks. Well, Gus, it was, we've been talking a lot this summer, but you know, there's a different, one of the things that we're all dealing with, you know, even before COVID was the uh, understanding that the th kind of things that we make, you know, smaller films, gone a bit out of fashion yeah because of the internet and because of the way people see things now and you know even our friends not going to the movie theater as much of course they're not going at all do you think this pandemic is actually going to shift that even more to the smaller screen and, and make it more difficult to finance I mean, obviously, um, I shooting them are harder. It shifts it to the smaller screen, but in the smaller screen, you have a lot of independent works that are, um, you know, on YouTube or um, all over the place, and you know, valid, amazing works. So I think it's kind of good in some ways for smaller filmmakers um, and you know, political filmmakers or um, um, any other kind of filmmakers. Yeah. Do you think the streamers are going to still finance or expand financing on, on the smaller, less starry films? Have you found that to be the case lately? 
Well, I think that there's, yeah, there's a lot of need for materials. So I think it will naturally sort of bleed over um, into the, into everyone that's, that's making things. Um, so um, I, I see that happening. I'm, I don't really, I don't have a personal, like, uh, you know, project yet with a streaming company, but um, someday. I thought you do, don't you, with the... the, sh the well, I'm talking, yeah, actually, I'm talking with one company about this small project, but, you know, um, it's in development. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm working on a couple of TV projects, too. I mean, I've always, both of us, obviously, stories are stories, and some can be told, you know, over a longer period of time, and the things we're used to making tend to be in... in in time it is really more like short stories. Films are really short stories uh, and series are more novels or at best. And, um, you know, we, we can have t a taste for both of them. I mean, in fact, it's kind of shocking to me when people tell such a full story in an hour and a half. I mean, after watching so much TV now, you're like, how the hell do, do people do that? How did we yeah, do that? It's hard. It's hard. I mean, although that's what we do. So, um, it seems hard to make something that is endless, you know, that is like 15 <laughs> hours. Um, especially when I watch a streaming show, it's, um, it kind of goes by in a strange way, like a different way than a, in a theater. Yeah. Um, it's like reading partly. And then it's like, you kind of space out. Yes. Yeah. Strangely. And a lot of them are very plot driven. So the more moodier features that we're, that we like would wouldn't really translate to a long a long story necessarily because there's something also about the home viewing experience where people are doing other things while yeah. watching which i find annoying but it's what happens you know people pee they check their phone they check their email they even take a call during it and of course the way people create their TV shows are almost taking that into account, like repeating information, which I always find annoying. You just said that, you know, <laughs> but then there's a lot of great shows. I mean, I've been watching, I've been enjoying the great, you know, which is the Catherine, the great series yeah. by the people who made the favorite. And what we do in the shadows is so much fun. I don't know if you've caught that one, the vampire one. Um, no, I haven't seen that one. It's fun. It's the guy, you know, it's the Flight of the Concords and uh, Taika Waititi created it. Oh, wow. It. Oh, wow. Nice. Very fun. It's like lame vampires in Staten Island. And, uh, and then uh, started watching I May Destroy You. I don't know that one. Studio. It's this woman, Michaela Cole, who did a series in Britain called Chewing Gum, which is really funny. And this is a more realistic... Uh, she's dealing with a possible sexual assault that she doesn't remember, you know, um, and it's really well made. I've just got through the first two. So there's, there's tons of good stuff. Um, in the lockdown, we've both kind of been guiltily enjoying the productivity of the lockdown. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to, I mean, at least there's, you know, something for me to work on and you yeah. too, you're working on something. Yeah. And then I've been writing songs. Um, yeah. How, how was the um, Lindsey Graham song? How did that come <laughs> that about? Come about? Yeah. Well, check, yeah. If you guys go on social media or, or YouTube, look up uh, B Lindsey Graham. It's a song that Lance Horn wrote and I sang on, which is using the, the lyrics are the tweets that have been coming out from sex workers saying that they've been male sex workers, they've been with Lindsey Graham and it's time to, to out him and put a stop to this Trump, you know, Trump puppet who probably got blackmailed in order, you know, cause he used to be the big Trump uh, questioner and was yeah. the best friend of McCain, you know, the only Senator standing up to Trump and who is, of course, humiliated in life and death by Trump. So Lindsay Hell is going to be spending time in his personal circle of hell <laughs> that he's created. 
Uh, so we made a song uh, called Be Lindsey Graham using the text of the tweets, and it's a lot of fun if you check it out. And is it a story that's like been confirmed or is it still? Well, I mean, confirmed as much as anything in that two or three sex workers have come out saying that, you know, that he hired them. So it's, right. you know, kind of their word. I don't think he's really responding right now. Um, oh, but really? Is it like that, it's that bad? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's really hit the mainstream. Like I've only seen it, you know, in gay press and, and, and social media. Um, there's been a couple of, you know, local South Carolina mentions of it. And they're at pains to say, um, there's nothing wrong with the fact that he would be gay. <laughs> but, you know, we're reporting this and it's, it, I think they're taking that moral high road of like, how dare they out someone uh, who's been voting for homophobic legislation. <laughs> Um, I don't believe in outing unless someone is truly dangerous, uh, like him. You know, there was a few Congress people that were outed uh, who were clearly anti-gay. And um, good riddance, you know, it's like... And how did you get um, to be part of that project? Lance was well, writing it or... Yeah, Lance is writing. He's a, a wonderful cabaret legend in San Francisco or in New York, and he we did we did songs. We've done songs together before. So uh, he just said, "Would you do you know a bit of this?" And it's been great. Um, and I'm I'm starting to write you know songs with all kinds of people, even strangers on the internet, uh, which has been a lot of fun. And like for instance, that song did you uh, did you record it at home or did you go into a studio? yeah. Yeah, because, I, because I've been making podcast series, uh, that was another form that we, we can talk about is, you know, as film becomes a, a bit more difficult, um, television, po fictional podcasts, of course, web series, which seem to be have, losing their luster lately, um, and pure music, you know, are, are other venues for storytelling. And I made a a series called Anthem Homunculus, uh, yeah. which is on the Luminary platform. But in that, I learned how to really, you know, get a nice mic and a preamp. And so I carry that with me. And that's how I've been writing songs with so many people is I have my own stuff. I can just record off my computer. And uh, it feels very freeing. And then, you know, one song I wrote with a stranger in France, we did a duet. I got my friend Cassie to do harp in New Orleans. Lance did strings with Thor G. Thor, who was a member of Drag Race. Um, and then a guy, uh, Kevin Ratterman, mixed it in LA. And everyone does it for free and for fun. And hopefully we'll make a COVID uh, benefit album or, or Black Lives Matter or you know whoever's in need at that moment uh, with the stuff that we've been making. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and are you uh, working on a new podcast? Um, you made, you're finished with Anthem. Finished with Anthem. That's out, um, which kind of sprang from a Hedvig sequel, but became more about my life. If I had never left my small town and because for podcasts and, and short things, it's very easy to get very great people because you can do it very quickly and, so we have Glenn Close and Laurie Anderson and Cynthia Erivo and, you know, Patty Lupone. We have an amazing cast uh, because I can do their whole season in two or three days and write for their voices, you know, for their singing and speaking voices. So it's a wonderful form. And I may do that with one of my stories that I have been trouble, having trouble getting on television, uh, which is really feels very about today, you know, it's like if we could start over as a nation, how would we do that? You know, what, what would our constitution be like now? One that, you know, in, in effect, our constitution is the oldest working constitution in the world, even though it's only 200 and some years old. And it shows, <laughs> you know, there's some cracks in it. And that's what the amendments were supposed to fix. But of course, in this polarized time no one's going to be 
adding any amendments, you know. That's why the Supreme Court is so important and this election is so important uh, in many ways, uh, so many ways. Uh, it's amazing how many ways it's, it's important <laughs> lately. And it's very exciting to see the changes on, you know, to see what's going on in the street and in terms of Black yeah, Lives Matter. incredible, incredible. Which never would have happened without, uh, you know. COVID. Without COVID, without Trump stumbling on COVID and without those horrible events that happened right back to back. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the fact that people can go can go every day and uh, and march and protest and not miss work or school. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, amazing timing. Yeah, uh, and I and really, it. I think the COVID um, staying inside really fueled like a lot of energy that burst out onto the street. Um, yes, kind and of the weather like, helped, and you know, and the cops didn't help. Of course, I have I have friends who are cops, and they're very ashamed. They're very ashamed of, of, you know, the whatever percentage of them that uh, are power, have problems with power and and, um, and uh, tend to abuse it. Yeah. You, don't, you don't get fireman brutality, you know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't attract that. But it also attracts good people. So, you know, I, I, I see change happening and perhaps being the thin end, end of the wedge for other change that's necessary for healthcare, for education, for economic equality. And, um, you know, I, this election will be, is more historic than ever. Yeah, for sure. And you what know? happens between now and the election is oh my God. questionable, Anything, scary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's, un, he's not above any, any tactic now, you know, starting a war, whatever it is. I wrote something on Instagram where I predict, I had a prediction of, of, uh, of January 1st when the, you know, when the new hopeful president comes in, uh, which I'm thinking of making into a song, uh, which does involve um, cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's funny you were mentioning us being part of the new queer cinema. We're definitely the old queer cinema. That's what <laughs> we're it looking feels like. Well, <laughs> no. especially now. Um, even I, I think that um, you were part of the, the new queer cinema at the time. I think I was a little bit, I was Early. older than everybody else. Um, I feel I was, like you and Derek Jarman were the godfathers. Yeah, we were, um, he was even earlier, but um, yeah, we were, yeah. we were earlier a bit. Um, but it was an amazing uh, turn of events and an amazing moment in time. And I feel like Sundance was like one of the, uh, helpers, you know, for uh, people to see a lot of uh, queer cinema and gay cinema. Sundance and the Sundance uh, Labs run by Michelle Satter, yeah. you know, the unspoken saint of independent American film. From the beginning, their mission was to get voices out that were not being heard. And in the labs, which I went to, was indispensable for me. There were there were voices from all parts of America, and that was very much part of their deal before many other people were thinking in terms of diversity. And you know, my classmates went on to produce, you know, Empire and make, you know, Winter's Bone, and and you know, th these were amazing people. Um, I wasn't even a filmmaker, and I. I learned so much from that four week experience. And I, Michelle is really very humble, but she has done more than anyone in the last 25 years to, uh, to make film, make the best of what American film is. Yeah. You know, and you, you were even my advisor at, at the lab. I wasn't a, yes. I was sort of a, I happened to be there uh, for another reason. And then I joined, the advisory group, which I remember um, Alfonso Coran was one of them and Delroy Lindo. Lindo yes. And, uh, forgetting the others, but um, it was a, it was amazing period. And, uh, um, and you, like you had developed Hedwig as a stage act at Don Hills. Yeah. Or Squeezebox. Was it, was there a life before Don Hills? 
Uh, Squeezebox is where I did my very first gigs for Hedvig, which was a punk rock drag club in 94, it started. And I was a more traditional actor, you know, Broadway and TV. And I, but I, I felt punk rock and drag were more exciting than stuff I was seeing on Broadway, for sure. And I thought it's, what is more Broadway than drag or <laughs> punk? You know, they are very theatrical and it was only homophobia and middle-class, you know, panic that made them not, that stopped them from being on stages. You know, there was, there was Charles Bush, there was Charles Ludlam who were yeah. certainly working drag on stage, but you know, the intensity of Squeezebox and singing these, you know, violently rebellious songs coming from queens that didn't even know they were punk. They were lip syncing when they realized it, with punk, they could use their own voice and be even more effective instead of imitating or commenting on Cher or, or Diana Ross. And uh, it was so thrilling to watch them and learn from them, you know, Lady Bunny and Jane County and uh, Mistress Formica and all of these people, Vag Vaginal Cream Davis, uh, who was six foot five, is a six foot five, you know, she would not call herself a drag queen, but she's definitely, a, you know, has worked with gender and rock and roll and music. And she had a band called Black Fag, <laughs> which, <laughs> are, <laughs> which I loved. Um, so these were my mothers, my drag mothers and, uh, so when I got to Sundance, you, start, you started out with just um, just songs, or was there the monologue as well? There was a story, a vague story, using the origin of love. You know, the idea of seeking your other half. But Tommy Gnosis used to be the lead, and he was the son of the general who became a rock star. And Hedvig was based on my babysitter, who was also a prostitute uh, from Germany, a, a biological woman. And being in the club full of drag and trans and, and rock and roll, it influenced the story and Hedwig became the main character. Uh, much more interesting than Hed the one. Hedwig, Hedwig won out. Hedwig won, even though she's had a hard life. But, so and you even came they, out, originally you came out as Tommy Gnosis and then Hed Hedwig would show up? Well, Tommy was just part of the script. Um, I actually did one Tommy show because at, at one time, if people know the play, it's a single gig next door to a stadium where her lover, Tommy Gnosis, is performing, having stolen right. her songs. Right. So I thought it'd be interesting to do a Hedvig show and then a Tommy show on the stadium, like two shows alternating. And I had a whole story for Tommy about him being replaced by a stalker who took over, you know, who did plastic surgery to take over his career while the real Tommy is, is tied up somewhere, you know, with a video camera in front of his face. Um, so I did one gig as Tommy, uh, which was so bad that I just went back. To <laughs> I, I was talking to some homeless people on the street while dressed up in silver makeup getting ready to go on. I said, come on into the club and, and, and watch my show. So they thought I was a real rock star telling the story of, uh, you know, being drunk and killing a lot of uh, disabled kids, which ended my career. And this was my comeback. And I had this whole thing where I was going to stage dive and not be caught. So I had like stage blood and like chiclets in my mouth to spit out teeth. Wow. So I did a stage dive where nobody was and I hit the floor and was like, oh, you know, bleeding and teeth spit out. And the homeless people were like, call an ambulance. Tommy knows this is <laughs> broken his face. Um, but it was, uh, it never took off. <laughs> Tommy was a flop. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, I'm trying to, I'm also reminding people that on the Criterion channel, both of the films you mentioned, uh, My Own Private Idaho, Idaho and Mala Noche are playing. Yeah, they're there. As well as a film that we helped along called Tarnation. Tarnation just got uh, put on. That's great. Yeah, it's a brilliant film by Jonathan Coet, uh, which is, I think of as like an autobiography on ad. Yeah, such an amazing film. About relationships. 
mentally ill and but it's told in the most intoxicating way and he really did make most of it on his you know pre 2004 yeah. i movie program the i i movie program which really he used to the extent to the was, hilt to the hilt um yeah he used that's an everything. amazing thing yeah it's a beautiful film if anyone hasn't seen it check out tarnation it's a queer classic and also it uh i remember it was also fun i some i have fun in the marketing of films or other people's films it's a different it's a different skill uh to making a film and many filmmakers hate it right they're just like oh yeah. But I actually enjoyed the challenge of it. And I remember when we were marketing it at Sundance, you know, Stephen Winter, the producer and I uh, were thinking about it. And um, I said to Jonathan, how much did this, before music rights and film rights, how much did this film really cost to make? Because a lot of it is his home movies that he shot when he was yeah, eight. Tapes, yeah. yeah, just homemade eighties tapes of himself and his mother. And he said, well, it's, it was about $200 if you just count the, <laughs> the tapes. And I said, yeah. no, it was $218.32. <laughs> you can't say $200 to the press because they won't believe it. So I gave them an exact amount. And that was the, the headline for the, the first feature in the, in the Times was like- Yeah, remember when, when you came to uh, Portland, you were working on a project and uh, you were writing. And you had a goodbye party. You were going back to New York. And uh, people would come in and they would sort of rush up to me and say, have you seen Tarnation? And I didn't know what it was because you had showed it to different people during your stay. In Portland, yes. In Portland. And I kept hearing about it just because it was like the, the greatest movie they'd ever seen. Um, uh, I think it was maybe Greg Sachs or I'm trying to remember who it gave was it. Like, uh, Jimmy Bolton and... Um, yeah. Dan, um, uh, forgetting Dan's last name, but um, yeah, and they showed it to you a tape. No, you. I asked for a tape because they kept oh. asking. They, people kept oh, telling right. me about it, and I said, "Do you have anything?" And I think you had, you had like something to show, and it was three hours long. Yeah, it was the first cut. Yeah, uh, which was very mesmerizing. Yes, <laughs> very mesmerizing, and Sundance. It wasn't particularly. Didn't, didn't get a lot of love. It, um, the Village Voice was the only one who really said it was the most interesting film of the festival. But then it, it took us getting to the director's fortnight in Cannes to get it into the world. And, but at the time, you had to have a print for Cannes. And a print could cost $25,000, which seemed very unfair to these young filmmakers that they would demand a print when there was still pretty good- When it was $200. Yeah, there was pretty good HD cams that could play, but you know, it was France and you know, very traditional. So we were running around, I was doing benefits to try to get the money. And we finally found a distributor, the wonderful Wellspring. Um, Steve made a lot, but that was the thing, Steve Bannon ran it. Was he at Cannes? Steve Bannon? I never met him. I don't think he was, but Jonathan met him. <laughs> and it was like years later when Trump Trump was in, we were like, oh my God, Tarnation and Brown Bunny were, <laughs> were sponsored by the guy who wants to, you know, get right you know, all the non-white people out. It was just very embarrassing. He also, if you recently, there's that documentary about Biosphere. Oh yeah. He, he was, invested in Biosphere. Sphere, well, right? it was taken he away bought. from the original guy and he was, he was brought in to be the new face of Biosphere. Um, and he looks like an asshole back then too. I mean, it's not, he was just thinner. <laughs> I wish they'd left him in the Biosphere forever. <laughs> <laughs> but Malanoche was a big deal for me, um, Gus, because, you know, I was coming up in the 80s, not even though I came out of traditional theater and even Broadway, I wasn't of it. And I was looking for those, you know, the alt queer filmmakers, the, the ones that I thought of as the more, you know, punk. And, you know, the original punk filmmaker, queer filmmakers were probably 
you know, who? Like uh, Jean Genet, really, with oh, yeah. Un Chant d'Amour, his brilliant short that was Cocteau. very... Cocteau. Cocteau, who was less punk, but he was definitely, a, you know, a queer icon. I mean, there were a lot of great directors um, also in Germany who were, who were very out in their own, in their own special way. Um, but it took, it took really you and Derek Jarman, Fassbender. Yeah, Fassbender, yeah. Yeah, Fassbender was really, you know, the, the unapologetic, you know, queer master, even though he had very little hope for the world. He was very fierce. Yeah, he was fierce as hell. And, you know, of course, Amadovar in the early 80s was important. And, and certain films like Parting Glances, and, you know, always resonated. But for some reason, Malanoche really hit me the hardest. And I remember I wrote you a, a fan letter. Um, I don't know if you got a lot of fan letters back then. I think um, you and Greg Araki you that I remembered. Yeah. Oh. And then you found a picture of me when I auditioned for Drugstore Cowboy. Yeah, exactly. A Polaroid. Okay. Where my, you know, I still use it as my headshot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we can use some time to, for people to ask questions, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. There's no one there. Unmute my uh, microphone <laughs> here. Um, it's b before we go to questions. I, I actually did rewatch some of your movies, Gus. I rewatched uh, my own Private Idaho last night in preparation for this. I hadn't seen it since since it came out. Wow! And I was amazed at how much stuck with me, and that I remembered. But one thing I'd completely forgotten is that one of the Johns is Mickey Cottrell. Yeah, yeah. your old co-conspirator. For the um the parties at sundance that's Don't. right that's right he used to have the best parties um he had the queer parties there in the early 80s at this former church and he would joke he was like that was the time where they found that the size of your hypothalamus could determine if you were queer and he was he was measuring hypothalami <laughs> the door and i I remember it was too much for the party was too queer for some. I think John Cusack ran screaming. Um, <laughs> but Brad Pitt, always a friend of the gays, uh, I think sat on the fence outside <laughs> in the sub zero. And I was like, Brad, come on in. He was like, I'm good on the fence. <laughs> he was always a good guy. Um, but yeah, I met so many people there who I worked with later, Christine Vachon, Todd Haynes, um, Christopher Munch, uh, Tom Kalin, who helped me at Sundance. And I was just a little punk with no, uh, nothing but a picture and resume, which I handed to Christine, she reminded me. Can you imagine handing a picture and resume to someone at a film festival? So uncool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mickey was the person, uh, I think it was somewhere like the, at a festival, it may have been after Sundance where he said to me, you have to see that. I, I want you to see this movie. The, the, the festival was over, but he sent me to a screening of Tarnation. Oh, wow. He was the one that was, was doing the publicity for it and told me to go and see it, and it blew my mind. He was in my film Short Bus, as well as Gus's film uh, Private Idaho. Um, in Short Bus, he's, he's a body that at the bottom of a jacuzzi that someone steps on. <laughs> He was very up for it. Um, and then he was the hilarious clean freak in, in Idaho. And one of the fun things being in Palm Springs during COVID is Gus introduced me to Udo Kier, mm. another um, queer icon of film who's done 250 films. Yeah. Uh, and was a boyhood friend of Fassbender in Cologne when they were both boy hustlers <laughs> wow. at the gay bar. So there's Wait, some no, stories. We showed, we showed his movie. Yeah, we showed Baccarat. Which was amazing. Which is so great. And he was the villain, soldier of fortune. But you got to get, you got to interview Udo uh, for Film International. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so some questions here. Uh, first one up from Jet. 
asks you both, how do you feel queer cinema has shifted or changed since you both started out? Well, it's just proliferated, proliferated to the point where it's just like, on my YouTube feed, it's like everywhere, all the shorts, features, it's just, I mean, it's amazing. Um, yeah. A chance, it's a big difference. But I mean, sometimes I'm, you know, one of the prices of acceptance is, is a little bit of, you know, I'm not saying mediocrity, but like maybe less risk taking. You know, people were panicked that, that gay marriage would just make us all into, you know, straight sheep. I actually disagreed, and I think it's actually helped marriage as an institution, to made straight people consider their own laziness and gender roles and monogamy and things like that. Um, but I am sort of missing the quote unquote punk queer films that really launched me. and. Uh, you know, as things get more accepting, there's, you know, RuPaul has kind of standardized drag. It's definitely given a lot of careers to a lot of talented people, but it feels a little bit standardized. You know, you have to lip sync, you have to do this and that. And to me, drag was a form that you can do a lot of things with, just like film. Um, I feel like other countries have been a little bit more interesting lately with uh, their queer films because they're still in major um, minority and certainly trans people who have faced more prob you know, more resistance lately than just gay people have been pushing the limit, you know, pushing it, uh, storytelling in a more interesting way. Um, but I don't know. We both came up in the Warhol, the Fassbender, the, uh, you know, the, the German era and those iconoclasts, I, I want more, you know, I want to see who the other freaks are, not just queer, because queer is a, a neutral thing that you can do some, you can do something radical with, you can do something simple and, and, you know, useful, like Love, Simon, or uh, any number of, of, uh, let's say, mainstream things, which are important too. Uh, I think ba Baccarat, is, is that how you say it, Baccarat, is one, mm -hmm. of, those, one of those finds. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it comes from a queer lens, you can see, though it's not overtly queer. You know, the gangster uh, icon in that is, is played by a, a person who usually does drag, but you don't really, you don't really get it. You know, it's more, un, it's, it's just sort part of, more, of the fabric of the, of the piece. Yeah. Which is ultimately perhaps our goal is to just remind ourselves that the fabric is broad and, you know, diversity of story, not just diversity of identity. Um, the goal is that everything is game for stories, everything um, and every form, you know, with short bus, I, I just, was looking at Catherine Brea and other people and Jean Genet and Frank Riplow who made Taxi Tsum Klo, which was a very influential queer film that used real sex. And I said, well, these people are using sex in an interesting, thoughtful way. And it wasn't that American thing. It was like sex is, it has to be hot or it's not, what's the purpose? You know, that's the sort of capitalist porn version of sex. You know, porn is required uh, porn's job is to jerk off to, um, whereas sex is much more, com you know, it, it's more complex to be just left to porn. You know, there's so much going on there. And it's my, our version was more kind of a comic melancholy. Um, so to me, maybe films don't need to be just about queer people, you know, you, Gus, are a queer person, so that just suffuses anything you make is your experience. So is Finding Force or a queer film? Maybe. You know, it's about an outsider trying to fit in. Um, Sean Connery and, was playing him as a gay man. He was? His character, yeah. But the studio didn't really want to hear anything about that. They were sort of subverting <laughs> that. But he was playing that, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was a chosen family story. You know, and that's a queer story. 
uh, which is different from say an African-American story where, where you don't necessarily have to come out to your parents as black, you know, so a, a queer point of view is going to be always different. It's maybe in, in some ways closer to the, um, though not equated in any way, but I just saw the film Crip Camp that my buddy Howard Gertler produced. And there, I was like, wow, this disabled movement feels very queer to me because, you know, I could go to a gay bar in Turkey and meet someone from Azerbaijan and you have an instant kinship of queerness that crosses borders and races and gender even. It doesn't mean you like everybody, but there's a kind of instant thing that happens, I understand too, of like in the so-called crip community of disabled people where you don't fit in with your family necessarily and you have to make your chosen family. So the idea of chosen families, of marginalized group telling stories uh, is going to, I mean, every artist has, feel, has felt left out. I think that's part of the reasons they are they are artists, so you're always going to get the misfits in the arts and humanities. Um, and queer is just one, you know, one way to look at the world. Even as we move towards sort of acceptance and, you know, we now have the, you know, married with the two kids in the suburbs and, and, and a Labrador, like, what does the new queer cinema look like in that world? Like, do you think we'll see a, a gay James Bond? Like, that sort of queering of the mainstream is that possible jimmy jimmy bond <laughs> i wanted to write one yeah you know. did you i i was working on a a queer jimmy bond like a but it was just for fun i think justin vivian bond um i would love that my gosh you know when people were like black panther breaking you know breaking uh boundaries um you know, African-American being as mainstream as, making it as mainstream a film as Iron Man or any other and being a hit, that was important. Personally, the film didn't really do much for me, but you know, one of our goals is to be as, you know, be as, be like everybody else. <laughs> you know, make money like the people that are in charge make and, you know, to me, I, I found the message garbled in that. I didn't think it was that smart, but it was, you know, well made, well acted. So I think a bit of that in the queer realm would be great. You know, I'd love to see, you know, the queer Nancy Drew. I mean, she obviously always was queer in my view, um, but, you know, I love to queer the mainstream, but I also think it's very important to remind ourselves that, you know, nurturing the outsiders, is that's where we came from. Um, I think queer people will always have a sense of the outside, be, again, because their families are not necessarily queer. Um, but the price of this assimilation is fewer suicides, fewer queer bashings. Um, if the result is more gay Republicans, well, you know, that's just, that, that's, I'll pay that price, you know. Um, and it's sad, but, you know, weirdly, I've, I've been playing, you know, a version of Milo Yiannopoulos, who's the ultimate quizzling, you know, kind of opportunist, queer and culture type, uh, who seems to be burning bridges right and left, which is sad because he seems fairly smart. But, um, speech, though, didn't he? He what? He just found a niche, like a, a, a gap. A niche, yeah, which he immediately got pulled out from under him because because he's an asshole. You know? and, you're, and you're playing him? I'm playing a version of him in uh, The Good Fight on CBS wow. called, uh, you know, but it's really fun because I'm actually upgrading his personality to make him more fun. <laughs> um, but I... I, 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 I sang a song called, Hi Archie. There's the dog I'm living with. Um, I, I, uh, there, there was an episode where uh, Hillary wins. It's a fantasy episode. Hillary won the presidency and 
I have a show on the Trump network and I'm singing, this wall is your wall, you know, and all these, you know, kind of Andy Williams type songs for, uh, and make, make them for Trump. Uh, but hopefully the, the, our satire for Trump will be over in a few months. A question from Via Via, who asks you both uh, to talk about your rehearsal process with actors and how it has evolved over the years, especially non-musical sequences. Do you rehearse a lot, Gus? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think when I first started out, I had, um, you know, small rehearsal periods, but then Drugstore Cowboy was the one where we had sort of an ensemble of four people. And we just, mostly what we would do was um, read from the script, but then in that case, everyone would go off the page and do things that they would normal, you know, they would do in character. In that case, they were um, robbing drugstores in the story. So we decided to go drive to a drugstore and they were all in character. Um, Kelly Lynch and Matt Dillon, um, James Legro <clears throat> and Heather Graham were um, sort of casing a drugstore. And I remember we had a car accident on the way, a little fender bender, and they sort of handled it in character. So it, oh. it sort of loos loosens you up. That, that yes. was really, um, a helpful aspect of it. I think it's super useful in creating bonds between the characters uh, by way of the actors. Um, if you're married, you want to hang out, you want to do stuff together to just get your shorthand communication and vibes. Doing scenes themselves sometimes because film is so fast, you don't, I think both Gus and I are aware of the dangers of over rehearsing, uh, especially emotional scenes. You don't want to, you know, cry them out before you get to the scene. And an actor will be aware of that. An actor will sometimes ask for rehearsal or say, no rehearsal, please. Maybe just talking, you know, just talking about the scenes. Um, for theater, you have months to get ready. So, you, you know, it's kind of good to... But you, for film, you rarely get to do that. For short bus, we actually had no script. And I just cast interesting people who might want to go down the journey with me of using sex in a different way. Uh, and some were pre-existing couples and some were, you know, new fake couples. And we were only rehearsed the sex a couple of times. It maybe I thought of it like a crying scene. You don't want to shoot your wad. Um, and, uh, but it was interesting to do a sexual scene. Uh, like any scene, the character needs to know what they want. And that's often the best direction is not... You know, I think Gus will agree that the worst direction is putting a don't before it. <laughs> you know, if someone is moving their hands too much and say, don't move your hands, all they think about is their hands and they can't act anymore. But to re you might say, um, you're in in incredibly calm telling this story. So do it very, you know, give it a minimal, do, do as little as possible and go light laser beam. And then instantly the hands go away, but that's a positive way of doing it as opposed to a negative. Because a negative just makes an actor self-conscious. And Gus is great at giving actors, respecting them, giving them their space, um, which is why he always attracts great actors. I, I think I do too, because we, we respect them as partners rather than think of them as pawns. You know, there's a lot of great filmmakers like Kubrick, but Actors were chess pieces, you know, most people reported that. What, what about the process of working with a group of actors where they have different methods and some take a while to warm up and others don't want a lot of rehearsal because they're kind of very fresh straight out, you know, I'll take one or two. Like how, how do you square that circle? I, yeah, I had um, a situation where out of the two leads, uh, one lead really refused to um, go off the page and the other lead only wanted to go off the page. So, and somehow it worked out. So I'm not sure how that worked out, but um, 
we would just do it and something would happen. And uh, that was Idaho. <laughs> um, I, th I yeah. think it, um, like for short bus, I did have experienced actors and then not experienced actors. And I found the best way was, first of all, we created story through improv. And even in their auditions, there were stories they told that I would say, all right, I want you to help create this character exaggerating elements from your own life. So for example, the lead woman had had some problems accessing her org first orgasm when she was younger. And I said, what if you take it to the limit? She's never had one and even farther and she's a sex therapist. Um, and, and so we started with that and did a lot of improv. And so she, the actors brought stuff from their own life um, and exaggerated it. Then I wrote a script and I told them, I found that they were better when they were paraphrasing the script as opposed to doing it verbatim. Verbatim is easier for experienced actors. So I said, you can never learn the script, never learn it verbatim. But if a scene has 10 lines, you still have to do 10 lines, but paraphrase them in your own way for each take. And with certain things to help the editor. For example, they drink a glass of water after five lines, always do that, and then leave after the 10 lines so that the editor is you know, not too crazy trying to do continuity, but it really relaxed them. And you could rehearse in the paraphrasing way, which I think people like Cassavetes would do, Altman had his own version, Woody Allen, did, you know, they all worked with versions of improv. Uh, closer to the script or farther and closer to my script was better because you wouldn't get the ignore, you know, the tangents that would drive you a little bit crazy, but you still had spontaneity. Um, so for short bus and even for how to talk to girls at parties and a little bit of head, I used this paraphrase uh, thing and that worked for the non-professional actors as well as the professional. They could work together that way really well. Uh, we have a time for about two or three more questions. Uh, for you, Gus, Danny asks, uh, are there any characters in your films you would like to revisit? Uh, to revisit? Yeah. Hmm. I don't think so. I mean, uh, sometimes, I mean, not, but, no. I guess <laughs> the answer is no. But uh, I always wondered about um, Goodwill Hunting, whether or not Matt Damon and Ben Affleck would write like a, a story at their age now, you know, like, um, but that sort of depends on whether they would write it. So I sort of wondered about that. Right. Mm. Characters in Idaho, I think you'd know where they would be in like, sort of 20 years time, right? Yeah, I, with Idaho, I had I had wanted to make that into a television series at, on the Fox Channel, and I pitched it, but it didn't uh, fly. Um, recommendation: um, Someone's asking you um, for recommendations for good punk, uh, gay punk band. We should be listening to good gay what punk bands bands. Well, the downtown boys are great. Um, mostly uh, women of color, actually, and some guys. Uh, I mean, there's there's so many queer musicians now that you don't, they don't even feel the need to come out anymore, you know? Yeah. My, my friend's kid is, is, is teenager and gay and she's like, is there something you'd like to tell me? And it's like, oh, mom, nobody does that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uncool because it's like, why should you? You know, cause it's just who I am. But you know, obviously nobody wants to be told by their parents to come out. <laughs> but I think you could do better to uh, just, um, Google, you know, the, there's always a, a listicle of, of, of the queer punk bands of the moment. 
But I feel like women, especially in rock, are more ascendant right now. You know, it's like, it used to be the male place, right? The rock thing. Even though the original rocker was a queer black man called Little Richard, the original punk, you know? And David Bowie and Little Richard and John Lennon and Paul McCartney were all looked to him as the godfather, um, even more than Chuck Berry and, or Elvis. And the two, you know, the two uh, deaths that affected me in this COVID, well, the, this COVID time were Will Richard, Larry Kramer, and Hal, Hal Wilner, who was an amazing musical force. I didn't know Hal Wilner died. Yeah, he died of COVID. And oh, wow. his, his uh, covers album of uh, T-Rex was about to come out and will come out this fall with amazing people, you know, you too, and Elton John and, and uh, lesser known people. I, I actually get to do a cover um, of my favorite T-Rex song, which is actually used in Velvet Goldmine, yeah. which was a, I never got to work with Todd as an actor, even though he tr tried to cast me in two of his films because they were so low budget, I couldn't afford to fly myself there. <laughs> So I had to do off-Broadway theater because there was more money. A question for you, Gus, from Omer. Uh, do you mind talking a little bit about visual language of elephant and how it evolved, uh, whether you had any references? Yeah. Um, originally, I sort of came from this effort to, when we did Jerry, the movie Jerry, which was Casey yeah. Affleck and Matt Damon. Um, and and there's, the story was um, about these two guys that are lost in the desert, which was based on a true story. And um, I thought I was making a John Cassavetes kind of thing. And I was reading a lot of John Cassavetes books, books by, about him and uh, his methods. And I think when we, when we started making it, it sort of turned into something different. And we started emulating... Um, Instead of Cassavetes, we were emulating something I'd seen in uh, the works of Bela Tarr, oh, um, um, who's a Hungarian um, yeah. filmmaker. And he had very, very long, pensive takes. So we started doing that in that particular film. And I felt like I wanted to do more of that. Um, and it was, that particular film was strange because um, it didn't start out that way. It started out with, um, um, a pretty standard screenplay. And then I tried to um, bail from the project. It was an HBO project. And they wouldn't, um, they didn't want me to. They, they really wanted to go forward with, with the project. And I, I sort of started making ultimatums. Like I want it to be like Jerry. I want it to be uh, slow and pensive and tried to get sort of out of the project. And they kept saying yes. And so finally, um, <laughs> We found ourselves like, you know, casting there. And I think Harris Savitas, who had also shot um, Jerry, was the DP. And we didn't really know what we were going to do until the day of. You know, you can always change your mind just before you start. So you kind of like have these things in the air. And finally, we kind of committed to uh, these the style, which was also written in the script. By then, I had rewritten the script to be kind of a poem rather than a um, traditional screenplay. It was only like 20 pages. Mm. Um, and uh, we, we sort of kind of did another, another version of something like Jerry, stylistically. Slow cinema is, is a thing, right? It, I mean, Bella Tarr is the master of slow cinema. And yeah, and, it, and like he, he was sort of, I think, um, John Sko, who was like uh, another, Hungarian filmmaker, very famous filmmaker, um, who made the red and the white. And he, um, he also used very slow, pensive takes. And then of course, before him, like, uh, Tarkovsky, mm. um, was, was doing stuff like that. But yeah, well, there was a tradition. So you, you Jean Dielman. And Jean Dielman was another one. Yeah. Last days kind of falls under that too. Yeah. Um, and then last days we kept going. 
Except last days was literally Jean Dielman because um, we were in a house, it was different. And uh, we started actually using um, more mechanical architectural like angles to shoot the action, like always kind of like at right angles from the, from the room. And, um, um, and Jean Dielman was, I think, our, one of our big inspirations. Uh, Ackerman has a lot of effect on queer filmmakers. You know, Todd Haynes loved her and Jean Dielman is a classic, you know, feels like elephant to me. You know, it's a classic tale of like, somehow real, real time becomes tense, you know, and when things kick in, they're extru they're because of the pace, they're very powerfully jolting when the, you know, certain events happen. And elephants, you know, the most beautiful moment is at the end when the father just puts his arm on the shoulders of his son, looking towards the school where their shooting has happened. And it's just overwhelming, very small, gesture that wouldn't have worked in a busy film you know it wouldn't have resonated in the same way one of the one of the things in Jean Dielman and Chantal Ackerman's uh, maybe her other films too is um, the dialogue is not necessarily advancing the story it's not there to be the story the dialogue at least in Jean Dielman is there to be just between the characters um, it's something that concerns them. So she'll be talking about school with her son at the dinner table, but it's not meant to really include the audience in a kind of like um, story way. It's almost like uh, music between the mother and son, as opposed to involving the audience. And we were doing that in Elephant. And Todd kind of did that a bit in Safe, I think, you know. Also the shots are, are wider, characters are smaller in the frame. A close-up is shocking, you know, when it happens. And you feel distanced, but you're strangely compelled. And Safe was, I mean, it's, it's so COVID. It's sort of like, sort of like what we're doing now. It's so, it's yeah. So, trying to get away from. Yeah. Do you remember the moment, there's a scene where she's in the weird New Age camp and she approaches someone in their hut and they start screaming stay away stay away <laughs> that happened to me yesterday up where i am i didn't have a mask oh on the older woman was like stay away uh, a question for you john from danny will we ever see a hedwig sequel i don't think so stephen trask was not really interested the composer i did start to write it with him as a theater piece but he couldn't really express why at first he didn't want to, but to me, I don't ever feel a kind of sophomore slump or whatever. Just maybe it's because I've been acting for so long that a new thing is just a new thing. I don't feel pressure of the last thing, uh, having to measure up or anything. I really don't. And cause I know that can't things come and go and people's interest comes and goes and Hedvig, was a flop on on the screen and it barely hung on off broadway it was not ever really accepted or a, a hit till years later um i mean dvd made it a cult thing and people passed it from you know manicured you know nail polished hand to hand and that that's was you know that's very Hedvig you know she didn't she, didn't Hedwig have all these performances in different cities though all all across the nation it was like there was one in Portland L A San Francisco yeah. I mean it was a play which is also different from drag um, because other people could play the role no one else is going to play Lady Bunny or RuPaul um, but this was a character you know that anyone could play and that I come from the theater and I was thrilled like a parent when other people wanted to do it and interpret it the way they wanted to. I never wanted to control it. So it, it metastasized, you know, 
uh, but never made any money because it wasn't a mainstream thing and schools wouldn't do it because they were scared of the dra of the you know the the operation or the, whatever it was that scared them to me it feels very high, traditional head broadway you know to me but i know why some people didn't think it was now it's more part of the the broadway uh his, you know, the Broadway, when we finally got to Broadway, because they weren't ready for us in the 90s, we brought it there 2014 with Neil Patrick Harris, America's Sweetheart. And it was a huge hit. Uh, it was the very first time we actually made money from that big in 25 years. Um, so that, and I, you know, I wasn't famous enough to even open it. You know, I had, I replaced myself. <laughs> <laughs> later which I was very happy to do you know I didn't have to do all the press um and we will do it again you know on st when, when theater returns um so Anthem Homunculus is what remained of the Hedwig sequel uh that used to be in Hedwig's voice but we took the story which is about a a down and out person in a trailer in Junction City Kansas who has a brain tumor and is crowdfunding his treatment. We took Hedwig out of it like a benign tumor and it became about me, a version of me. Um, so I don't really feel the need to revisit the character, though it changes form. You know, doing the Origin of Love tour, which is really about the making of Hedwig, is a kind of version of, I'm not playing the character, but I'm referring to it and dressed sort of as her. So it, I, I love that it changes shape, that other key people can play it. You know, all genders have played it, all gender, gender identifications. It's a mask, it is drag. You know, it's not a trans story because the character was forced into this botched, botched operation by what I call the binarchy of uh, his boyfriend and family and government saying, you have to be this. If you wanna be free, you have to, this is what we've decided a woman is, and this is a man, and he's mutilated, you know, to fit into that patriarchal version of, of gender. Um, whereas we all have energies that are called male and female, and if we don't express them, terrible things happen, you know. It's like a, a, an animal dying in your wall. It can really stink the place up. And, you know, I'm very much a person that's against the binarchy, uh, because I believe that's a, a, a version of control and, and, and even capitalism. You know, if you can define it, you can sell to it and you can control it. Yeah. We are pretty much out of time. Uh, someone was asking about screening platforms we mentioned. I think it was only Criterion, right, that we talked about. Criterion has Idaho. And Idaho. It's got Hedvig. It's got right. Terminator. Uh, they did a wonderful pack uh, Blu-ray for Hedvig um, on Criterion. I think it's probably also on HBO Max because it's a Warner film. Um, our, our films tend to get lost. You know, that's another strange thing about the digital revolution is that the small films aren't necessarily money makers, so they don't get grabbed by the streamers. And right now, Short Bus is not available anywhere, except an old DVD. And I don't know if it's the same for Malanoche, you have to get the, the Blu-ray, you know, on Criterion, and we're hoping Criterion uh, does Short Bus too, so if you want to see that happen, give them an give They're them on an Criterion channel as well, right? You can stream Malanoche yeah. and Idaho. Yeah. Yeah, we, we love Criterion. I mean, they're the saviors of yeah, the right. yeah. uh, Any other picks? You talked about a lot of your favorites. Any other like queer picks for, for people to watch? Any favorites, Gus? One, one of the lost ones that I can't find at the moment is a Derek Jarman film called um, The Last of England. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which is really beautiful. Um, but it might be somewhere. I mean, I think you can see, see a little bit of it on YouTube. But uh, for some reason, that's a British Film Institute film too. So maybe in England, maybe there's a way to see it. Yeah, I think there is a BFI Blu-ray, but that's when I actually met him. I, it premiered at Berlin in 88, I think. And uh, so I got to meet him and it was so, you know, he really had a very 
uh, saint-like demeanor. You know, he was a true godfather and very benevolent, you know, and, but, uh, but also an instigator. And, you know, he was, he was, you know, Caravaggio and Edward II meant a lot to me as a kid. And Last of England was less effective for me, but it was very, very interesting. He it's, also, the, it's the arty one. It's very arty. And then there's blue. Blue, which, blue yes. Which is even more arty because the screen is nothing but a blue <laughs> blank field. It's like, a, it's like a podcast. It's a podcast. And in fact, I was inspired by blue to do a anthem homunculus marathon. I've done, I've done it in a few cities before COVID where we create, we actually created abstract visuals and we would play all five and a half hours with breaks. Um, I, I even handed out some THC drops and, and, um, and blankets like it was a flight or something, a psychedelic flight. Wow. Well, this has been a coffee talk with Film Independent. Uh, find out more about us at filmindependent.org or on the socials at uh, Film Independent, uh, at, um, at Film Independent, at uh, Instagram and Facebook. But uh, just leads me to say thank you to our two guests today, John Cameron Mitchell. John, thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Great to um, have you with us. Is this yeah. going to be anywhere, uh, archived anywhere? Yeah, it'll be on our YouTube channel and probably okay. on Facebook. I, I can Great. send you a link. Great. And Gus Van Sant, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great to Thanks, have you. Thanks, Gus. Guys. Love to Thanks you. Thanks, you guys. See you soon. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Be Bye. safe. Get justice. You too.